Welcome to the Church of Perpetual Life. My name is Neil Vandry, and I am your officiator here at Perpetual Life. We are in Zoom and a live stream only this month, and next month we'll be in Zoom and in person for our annual Remembrance of the Resurrectable Service. After our presentation tonight, we will have a questions and answers chat. Our services next month will be on Thursday, December the 15th, and we have Dr. Richard Ulrey coming. He'll be with us in person to speak on minerals and supplements. Also next month, we have Mr. Bill Falloon to give a brief annual talk as well. If this is your first time joining us at Perpetual Life, I'd like to invite you to join our email list so that you can get updates on all that is going on with super longevity so that you may live longer and healthier life. You can join our email list simply by emailing me through our website at www.perpetual.life. Join me now in observing our Perpetual Life Creed. We believe that all of life is sacred and that we have been given this one life to make unlimited. We believe in our Creator's divine plan for all of humanity to have infinite lifespans in perfect health and eternal joy rendering death to be optional. By following our gospel, we achieve eternal life, creating a heaven here on earth. We follow Nikolai Fedorov, who taught that the transcendence of the creator will only be solved when humanity and our unified efforts become an instrument of universal resuscitation, when the divine word becomes our divine action. And we follow Arthur C. Clarke, who said, the only way to discover the limits of the possible is to go beyond them into the impossible. And so we enter each day energized in spirit and empowered by the words of our prophets to live in joy, serving our creator and all of mankind forever and ever. This church, the Church of Perpetual Life, is a science and faith-based transhumanist church. Our faith is in the creator and in humanity to find ways toward healthy, unlimited lifespans. We are the only transhumanist church in the world and our services are recorded so that you can watch them and share them with all of the people in your life. And you may wish to have unlimited health and extreme, extreme longevity. You may wish to have parties and organize groups. Feel free to use our recordings for that. Here at Perpetual Life, you will find a community of other longevity enthusiasts discussing everything from AI, cutting edge discoveries in health, and cryonics. If you're curious about cryonics, feel free to connect with me to get more information about cryonics and other fields of interest that relate to extreme longevity. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Harry Adelson, and he's a specialist in stem cell technology. He was one of the earliest adopters of the use of stem cells for the treatment of chronic musculoskeletal pain. He began his training in regenerative injection therapy way back in 1998, while in the final year, in his final year at the National College of Naturopathic Medicine in Portland, Oregon. During his residency program in integrative medicine at the Yale Griffin Hospital in Derby, Connecticut, he volunteered after hours in a large homeless shelter in Bridgeport, Connecticut, providing regenerative injection therapies to the medically underserved while gaining valuable experience. He opened Doseri Clinics in 2002, and from day one, his practice has been 100% regenerative injection therapies, 100% stem cell therapy since 2010 for the treatment of musculoskeletal pain conditions. He has performed over 7,000 stem cell procedures and has injected stem cells in over 1,400 intervertebral discs, placing him solidly among those most experienced in the world with use of stem cells for the treatment spine pain. His client list includes Ben Greenfield, Mark Hyman, Dave Asprey, John Gray, Jim Quick, and Vishen Lakhiani. In 2020, he was the proud recipient of the Above All Patients First Award from the Cell Surgical Network. He is the inventor of the full body stem cell makeover, 
and is the founder of Doseri Clinics in Park City, Utah, where he lives with his wife and two daughters. So now help me to welcome Dr. Harry Adelson. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much. I just uh, had the pleasure of meeting you at the recently at the Radfest and had so much fun at that event. And I'm just thrilled to speak to your group. So um, if you guys don't mind, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna give you a, start out with a bit of a lecture. I think you can all probably see that. Um, so I I uh, became interested in. Uh, naturopathic medicine early on. And I learned about it. I was considering going to, you know, I was just deciding between going to chiropractic school versus conventional MD school. And I found out, I, I saw an ad for the National College of Naturopathic Medicine, and they listed the six guiding philosophical principles of naturopathic medicine. Uh, and most notably, the healing power of nature. And that just drew me in immediately. It made perfect sense to me. And while I was, uh, those early years that I was uh, at the naturopathic school, my whole life revolved around rock climbing. It, all my free time was spent rock climbing. And I was training for my dream trip to France, the birthplace of modern sport climbing. And I was working out in the gym and I did this hard cross through move and I felt this pop in my shoulder. And, um, you know, I, I, I thought that wasn't good. I had pain and swelling. And I, uh, I asked around, I found a, I found sort of a, a, a an, an orthopedic surgeon who is known for being sort of conservative and having a holistic view. And he said, well, you know, really all I have to offer you is I can put a scope in your shoulder and cut out this piece of torn cartilage, uh, which probably will help you in the short term, but it's going to give you problems later in life. Alternately, I can give you a steroid injection, which similarly will probably give you short term relief, but will actually contribute to the problem. And I thought, that's it. Those are my choices. Like that just made no sense to me. I it, it just did. I, I couldn't imagine that, that those were my only choices. So I started asking around uh, back then, you know, it was the it was the mid 90s. Uh, so when you did research, it actually meant you had to talk to people. So I was introduced to Rick Marinelli, who was the first naturopathic doctor to perform regenerative injection therapy, also called prolotherapy. And I'll describe a little later what that is, but essentially he did a treatment to me. It resulted in a complete cure. My trip to France was splendid and my life path unfolded before me. Now, if you look at the economic impact of pain. Pain is actually more expensive than cancer, diabetes, and, uh, and heart disease combined. The reason though that pain doesn't get anywhere near the, um, the research dollars is because unlike those big three, it doesn't kill you, um, but it is the number one leading cause of disability worldwide. And if you're, uh, if you're in, you know, for those of you that are interested in longevity, you know, one of the common threads with people who live long lives is having a purpose in life. Well, if your purpose in any way involves the use of your body, then having chronic pain runs the very real risk of re destroying your purpose in life. If you look at the conventional treatment of chronic pain, it's dismal, like low back pain, for instance. On the one hand, you've got narcotic pain medications and steroid injections, which are fraught with problems. And then you take this gigantic leap to surgery and uh, it, the, the outcomes for surgery are terrible. There's a, there's a chance it might help, but there's a considerable chance that it's gonna make you worse. And so why, why, why is the conventional approach to tr the treatment of pain so, so lacking? Well, for those of us in regenerative medicine, we think it's because they're actually addressing the wrong thing. See, in, uh, in sort of con the way we do medicine in this country is the way that uh, the way things are paid for is through this third party payer system. So you're my patient, but then the insurance company is the one who actually decides who gets paid for what. And they demand that you um, that you have objective evidence. And so we're so focused on the MRI 
And that and that's sort of the difference between macroscopic pain generators and microscopic pain generators. Macroscopic meaning what you can see on the MRI and microscopic means you don't see it on the MRI. If you look at the scientific literature, um, the, the, there is actually surprisingly no correlation between what somebody's MRI looks like and whether or not they have pain to begin with. If you take 100 people with low back pain, I'm sorry, if you take 100 people with no low back pain, people who've never had low back pain in their lives, and you do MRIs on them, what you'll find is that 60% of them are going to have abnormalities, and 15% are going to have abnormalities so significant that if they did have corresponding symptoms, which they don't, they would be candidates for immediate emergency surgery. Similarly, if you look at people who uh, have lots of low back pain, frequently their imaging is perfectly normal. So what does that mean? You know, it, it, this is so pronounced that the American College of Physicians, which is like one of the oldest groups ever, I mean, it's, it was opened shortly after the AMA, they actually issued a position paper in 2011 discouraging doctors from ordering MRIs at all for low back pain, because the only thing you really achieve by ordering an MRI is it increases the cost of the treatment and it increases the risk of the treatment. It does nothing to improve the outcomes. So in regenerative medicine, we then look to the microscopic uh, pain generators. So if you look at connective tissue, you know, what our musculoskeletal system is made of, it's comprised of these, of, of these, you know, really a miracle fabric. It stretches just the right amount in each direction. And the nerves that pass through it pass freely through it and don't fire pain signals. Similarly, there's just the right uh, amount of of uh, microvasculature, microcirculation to bring metabolic to the area and metabolic waste away. Well, when you have suboptimal healing, either you have a traumatic injury that doesn't completely heal or you have multiple traumatic injuries over many years, uh, two things happen. The connective tissue becomes chaotic. It becomes essentially a form of scar tissue. Instead of this nice miracle fabric, it's, it loses its miracle properties. It stretches too much in some directions and not enough in others. And the nerve fibers that pass through it get caught up and fire pain signals. Similarly, you grow too many blood vessels and they're irregularly formed. So it's a, it's a phenomenon called neovascularization, which is the hyper concentration of irregularly formed blood vessels. Now, th there's two problems there. One is every time you grow a new blood vessel, you grow a new sensory nerve along next to it. So now you have a hyper concentration of sensory nerves and these are irregularly formed blood vessels. So you lose the ability to bring uh, nutrients to the area and metabolic waste away. So you have all these sensory nerves that are oxygen deprived. So, it, those of us who do regenerative medicine, we think of the body as a garden, and we think of which tissue beds require tending, as opposed to conventional medicine, where the body is viewed as a machine comprised of parts, and, and the doctor's job is to figure out which parts need to be repaired or replaced. So how does our own garden heal itself? What's the healing mechanism if you sustain an injury? Well, let's look at that first. So blood vessels are ubiquitous. They exist in every tissue in the body with just a couple of exceptions, intervertebral discs and heart valves and a couple others. Uh, but whenever you have damage to a, a tissue bed, you get blood outside of a blood vessel. Whenever you have blood outside of the blood vessel, the platelets recognize that they are um, outside, they're no longer in a blood vessel, and they, uh, they release a growth factor that signals these, um, these pericytes, the cells that wrap around the blood vessels to release. So the, 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 the platelet finds itself outside the blood vessel, it releases platelet-derived growth factor. The platelet-derived growth factor comes into contact with the pericytes and the pericytes detach from these blood vessels. And pericytes are like Superman. 
their day job, their, you know, when they're Clark Kent, is to wrap around the blood vessel. And they're what are responsible for vasoconstriction and vasodilatation. That's what makes blood vessels smaller or larger. But when they detach, when they come into contact with this platelet-derived growth factor and they detach, they activate into mesenchymal stem cells. And mesen excuse me, mesenchymal stem cells have the ability when they, uh, you know, just like any stem cell, when they divide, they have the ability to either differentiate or self-renew. So they can turn into a new version of itself, or they can turn into all these different types of connective tissue, muscle, uh, bone, fat, uh, liver. You see all these that I have on this slide. The other thing that mesenchymal stem cells are capable of doing is something called the paracrine effect. Uh, they they actually recognize when they're in the presence of damaged cells and they signal to those cells to go into healing mode. They kill invading microbes, they control inflammation, and they trigger the healing of damaged connective tissue. So we have these stem cells in every tissue in our body, uh, and their job is to maintain the health of their, uh, of their micro environment. The problem is, though, when we exceed our body's ability to heal itself, when you, uh, when you either you have a very big injury and you don't completely heal, or you have these, you know, multiple micro injuries over a period of years and you just never completely heal, that's when you experience suboptimal healing, and that's when you get this, this, you know, unhealthy soil. So how do we? How do we repeat the natural uh, cascade that I just described? Well, early on, when I had my shoulder injury from rock climbing, my friend Rick Marinelli performed prolotherapy on me. And prolotherapy is the injection of natural substances. Most frequently, it's just a dextrose, like a sugar water. Uh, sugar is interesting because it's simultaneously nutritive. After oxygen, it's the most important nutrient in the body and it's slightly irritating. So essentially you're tricking the body into thinking that it's endured a new injury, thereby launching the body's natural healing cascade. You get the second chance at healing without actually having been injured. And for my first number of years, when I was at Bridgeport at the Bridgeport Rescue Mission and the homeless shelter that, that Neil mentioned in my intro, uh, that's mostly what I was doing. And it worked quite well. It required a bunch of treatments. Uh, you know, I'd have to do like a treat one treatment per month for like 12 months, but we would frequently get people better. So uh, then in 2004, 2005, platelet rich plasma hit the scene. And platelet rich plasma is the same exact concept of, the, of an injection therapy, but instead of using dextrose, you're using a person's own platelet. So you do a blood draw, you concentrate down the, 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 what's called the Buffy coat, which is where the platelets do reside, and you inject those. And what I found was it worked much better than prolotherapy using these, we call them orthobiologics. We call them, you know, these are substances from your own body. Uh, and I did that from, uh, I think it was 2006 to 2010. That was 100% of my practice. And that was really all, I, I thought that was what the rest of my career was going to look like. I didn't think it would go beyond that. And then in two, that early, late 2009, uh, uh, this, this lovely patient of mine came to me. And she, um, she, she put, she put it down a stack of papers on my, on my desk. They were animal studies and it was the use of bone marrow stem cells for the treatment of arthritis. And she said, um, Harry, I want you to put bone marrow stem cells from my bone marrow into my knee. We, she had this knee problem that I just couldn't quite get her all the way. We'd helped her quite a bit. Uh, with prolotherapy and then with PRP, but we could never quite get her all the way there. So she said, I wanted you to, you know, I want you to put bone marrow stem cells in my knee. And I thought, I don't know how to do that. And she said, so learn. And I said, you know, I, I have a friend in St. Louis who does this. I've heard of it. You can go to him. And she said, I don't want your friend to do it. I want you to do it. So I, you know, I, I couldn't really argue with her. I said, you know, then the next thought that came into my mind was, you know, I'm a naturopathic doctor. Do you know how much criticism I'm going to get if I start doing bone marrow aspirations? 
And she leaned across the table and she said, Harry, I'm a materials engineer for NASA and I'm a woman. So if you wanna to complain to me about people telling you that you're out of your league, I'm afraid you're talking to the wrong person. And I really had nothing else to say to her. So I went and learned how to aspirate bone marrow. And uh, I started doing it and I, it worked so well. I knew this was the future of regenerative medicine. So I ended up taking a course uh, with, the Amer with the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. They called it a fellowship in stem cell medicine. And this was back in you know, 2010 when there were very few people in the United States doing it. And what was interesting about this course was half the people in the audience were people from the US like me who were trying to figure out how to do this stuff. But the other half were South Americans who'd been doing it for years. And fortunately, I speak some Spanish. So I started hanging out with these guys and I asked them if I could come visit them. And they all agreed. Carlos Cecilio Brat was one of the first people I visited. One of these first trips that I did, I went to, I went to Venezuela <laughs> and I, I, San Carlos, Venezuela, which is the small town up in the mountains. And I went to his clinic and he had people from illiterate farmers to the Chavez family, to military elite and everyone in between. And what he would do is he had this very sort of funky old clinic that had all these little cots separated by curtains. It almost looked like a MASH hospital or something or an, or an old, super old fashioned chiropractic clinic or something. And he would just go from one bed to another and he'd take a 16 gauge needle, put it in someone's sternum, take out the bone marrow, put the bone marrow in a blood bag, fill it with ozone gas, and then give it intravenously. And he was getting amazing results. It was the simplest approach you could possibly imagine. His material cost was probably like 25 cents, no exaggeration. And he was treating anything that walked in the door and getting amazing outcomes. From there, from Venezuela, I went directly to Panama City, where I visited the Stem Cell Institute, which many of you have probably heard of Neil Riordan and the Stem Cell Institute. Uh, it's, you know, the most, probably the most famous stem cell uh, laboratory and clinic in the world. And this was the polar opposite. This was vastly complex, quite expensive uh, in, this, in this amazing facility. And what I saw there was people getting great outcomes, people being treated from all sorts of things and, you know, and getting very good outcomes. What I noticed was even though I was seeing like the two opposite ends of the spectrum, the simplest to the most complex versions of stem cell medicine back to back, they were both getting good outcomes. So I started thinking about, you know, in this country, we're so enamored with best practice, it's called, you know, the, the golden mean, like what, what's the best way to, to, to do something. And then everybody tries to conform to that. And I thought, you know, after that experience, I'm just going to do what I want done to me. And I'm going to attract people who think the way that I do. And that's what I set out to do. So during those early years, um, you know, very few people had heard of stem cells here in the US. So I was commuting, I would do one month at home. And then I would do the, fo the following month, I had the circuit that I would do where I would visit these different cities in South America to work. Um, it, I was going to Brazil. I, I met these, these really wonderful Japanese Brazilian doctors who had these booming anti-aging practices. And uh, they invited me to come down and perform procedures. And, you know, in the U.S., I was slow because so, many, so few people had heard of this. So I would go to them and they would line up all these cases. And uh, what that forced me to do was get very efficient, be able to move very quickly. Uh, and that that, that the, the reason I'm telling you this will make sense later in the talk. Uh, but also on my travels, I had this uh, series of stops that I would do. And one of them was with Carlos Chiriboga in Guayaquil, Ecuador. And uh, Carlos is an orthopedic surgeon and he was very interested in stem cells. So what we would do is I would go down there. I would harvest this patient stem cells first from bone marrow. And then after a couple of years from bone marrow and fat, I would hand the stem cells to Carlos and he would use them in conjunction with conventional orthopedic surgeries. So this is one such case. So this was an 11 year old girl who was thrown off the back of a motorcycle. 
and she suffered what we used to call a compound fracture. It's also called an open fracture. What that means is the bone was actually sticking out of the skin and the bone became infected as they frequently do in those cases. Uh, and it basically disintegrated. So she essentially lost, you know, like the, the prognosis for this girl to keep her leg is not good, very bad. So what Carlos did is he created a scaffold attached the two ends together. Now one leg was much shorter than the other. And what he did is every day he stretched it by one millimeter and once a week we would inject stem cells, bone marrow stem cells directly into the point of maximal growth. And this gal, last time I saw her, she was a senior in high school and um, she was on the soccer team <laughs> her parents told me that she was not a very good player, but who cares? <laughs> so during those years, I was treating uh, Gary Young. Uh, many of you might know him of Young Living Essential Oils. He tragically passed. Uh, but I had treated Gary uh, over a period of years, and uh, I'd helped him quite a bit with his back pain. For those of you who know Gary, uh, a tree fell on him when he was a young man, crushed his spine. And that's how he got interested in essential oils. Um, so he had come to me over the years and I got like, like Laura, my, like my other patient, I'd gotten him better to a certain point, but I just couldn't get him all the way there. He had this midline pain, worse bending forward. And I was learning enough about this that I, you know, I said, Gary, the reason that I can't quite get you all the way better is because you need stem cells injected directly into your intervertebral disc. And he said, okay, when do you want to do it? And I said, Gary, no, you don't understand. I don't, I don't know how to do that. See, in order to do that, you need to have x-ray guidance. And I don't have x-ray. I just have ultrasound. And so uh, I know a guy in Dallas who does it. If you want, you know, you have a private jet. I'll go with you. He said, I don't want your friend to do it. I want you to do it. And I said, Gary, you know, I'm a naturopath. If I start doing x-ray guided injection, do you know how much criticism I'll get? And he I said, they'll call me a quack. And he said, oh, they'll call you a quack. Ooh, that sounds pretty bad, Harry. By the way, have you looked up Gary Young lately? And, you know, Gary, for those of you who don't know him, you know, he, he, I think he had, you know, he he launched this multi-billion dollar corporation with his bare hands, with sheer determination and grit against all odds, with armies of detractors, you know, wishing him horror. And and it didn't, you know, stop him from creating his dream. And I realized how how absurd I sounded complaining about, you know, what other people would think of me. So that it flashed me back to my rock climbing days. And in rock climbing, what's interesting, and I'm talking about rock climbing with a rope. What's interesting about rock climbing is it's scary to do because when you fall with a rope, the rope catches you, but it's still scary to fall. And the people who are scared of falling never become good climbers. The only way you become a good climber is to lose your fear of, uh, of falling on a rope. Uh, and it's the difference between rational fear and irrational fear. Rational fear is what keeps you alive. Irrational fear is being afraid of things that really can't hurt you. And that lesson sitting there with Gary really sunk in. And, you know, I really stopped caring what the MDs think of me. And so I got x-ray. I learned how to use it. And, uh, you know, it's, I, I haven't looked back. That was back in 2013. What's amazing about x-ray guidance is you can now put stem cells anywhere in the body, including intervertebral discs, which normally have no blood flow at all. So in the early years, I was using bone marrow, but then in around 2013, I started hearing people talk about the use of fat-derived stem cells. And with fat, you can do a miniature liposuction, a lipoaspiration, take between 50 and 100 cc's of fat, put it through an enzymatic digestion. And now, instead of having in the tens of thousands of stem cells, like bone marrow, you have in the tens of millions of stem cells, uh, which you know, was fascinating to me. So what I did those early years, you know, I, initially I, my instinct was to just go ahead and combine the two. 
But I thought, you know, I should just try. Maybe one is better than the other. Maybe we don't need to combine them. And so in those early years, I would say, you know, would you like to do bone marrow, with which I have quite a bit of experience, uh, and there's scientific data, you know, reinforcing its use, or would you rather use fat, which I have less experience with, but theoretically it might work better because you get so many more stem cells. And so people would self-select. A year after I followed up with people. And what I found was that the bone marrow people got consistently good results, uh, but it would usually take a couple of treatments to get them to where they were, they wanted to be. The fat people, when, uh, when it worked, it worked better than bone marrow, but it had a higher non-responder rate. So then I started combining the two. And what I found when I combined bone marrow with fat is I got the consistency of the bone marrow with the augmented improvements of the fat. And this is a paper that I wrote up describing my experience. Uh, this is another paper talking about in injecting intravertebral discs. Um, now, the issue that we ran into was in 2017, uh, the FDA decided that stem cells from your fat are a drug and a non-FDA approved drug. And their argument was like bone marrow, because it's, we're just centrifuging it, it's, you're, we're not actually doing anything to it. But with the fat, you have to enzymatically digest it. You soak it in an enzyme and heat it up. There's a couple of steps to it. And they, they decided that that was in fact drug manufacturing. So they, they launched two lawsuits, one in Florida. Uh, and in that case, the judge issued a summary judgment. Uh, so the, my friend, Kristen Comello, who there in South Florida uh, was found guilty without a trial. However, the case on the West Coast against my friends, the Bermans, with the California Stem Cell Treatment Institute, that was recently just decided like three months ago. And the judge ruled in favor of my friends. Uh, they decide, they, this, this judge determined that stem cells from your own body are not, in fact, a drug. So that was a huge victory uh, for really health freedom in this country. The newest type of stem cell from people's own body are these VSELs, the very small embryonic-like stem cells. These VSELs are cells that exist in our blood in large quantities. And whenever you concentrate a platelet-rich plasma, you're concentrating the VSELs, but those VSELs are completely hibernating. They're quiescent. Uh, they're not active. Uh, this, this, this guy, uh, Todd Ovokaitis, this doctor in Southern California, has developed a laser that activates these VSELs. We started using that about a year ago, and I've been very happy with the outcomes with that. Uh, the last sort of piece to my puzzle is uh, IV sedation. You know, these doing a bone marrow aspiration, doing a lipo aspiration, injecting into vertebral discs is very painful. There's no reason to do it awake. Uh, we sedate all of our patients. This is not general anesthesia, it's IV sedation. So it's the same as what you would get like for a colonoscopy, for, for instance. Now, I haven't talked to this point about the birth tissue uh, mesenchymal stem cells. Someone was asking me earlier, by birth tissue, what that means is what you see in this picture. Placenta, umbilical cord, and amniotic membrane. Nobody uses embryonic stem cells. Nobody uses fetal stem cells. So there's a lot of rumors out there. There's a lot of people saying, oh my God, you're using dead babies. We're not, nobody is, nobody uses those. The problem with the embryonic stem cells, apart from the fact that, you know, they're unethical to use, is they, those are the ones that turn into tumors. So even if you wanted to use it, they're a terrible one to use. Uh, the birth tissue stuff, placental, uh, umbilical cord, and amniotic membrane. This is the stuff that otherwise would go in the trash, right? It's the baby's born, mom gets the baby, and then you have the stuff left over that happens to be filled with stem cells. I am just now starting to use them. Um, oddly enough, up to this point, I've just been entirely using stem cells from people's own bodies. I'm just now starting to use them, largely because I finally found a lab that I have confidence in. That's one thing. The other is um, 
the last time I did a deep dive in the scientific literature was about three years ago, and I wasn't completely convinced. I wasn't, you know, there, there wasn't enough data on safety. Well, now I believe that there is. I think there's enough scientific data showing that using umbilical cord stem cells is safe. Now, there's the issue of culture expansion. Culture expansion means you take the stem cells and you grow them in a laboratory. This is the one thing that we cannot do in the United States is take like umbilical cord stem cells and grow them in a laboratory, which makes them, you know, brings the cost way down when you do it that way. So when you hear about people going abroad, it's for these culture expanded stem cells. I personally am not very excited about culture expanded stem cells because we don't really know what happens when you grow stem cells in a laboratory over and over and over again. Um, and I'd rather wait a little longer because you know, I'm getting good results with this other stuff. So I'd rather just stick with that and, and see what the data shows with the culture expanded stuff. Now, I told you guys when I was going to South America, uh, what I was doing there, but let me tell you about what my life was like the months that I was in the US. What was interesting is this is like 2010, 2011, 2012. The only people who had heard of stem cell medicine in this country were horse people, ranchers, wranglers. Uh, and the reason for that is because the very earliest adopters of stem cell medicine were the veterinarians. And so these, these, you know, these ranchers had these very expensive workhorses and they would get too old to work. So they would take them to this guy and he would do bone marrow stem cells on the horses. And suddenly they would get like two or three more years of work out of them. And these guys would say, you know, can't you do that to my low back and my shoulders? And the guy would say, well, no, I can't because I'm a veterinarian, but there's a guy in Park City doing this now, go to him. So that those early years, I was treating these busted up cowboys who had arthritis through their entire bodies. I would do their low back and I do their neck and I do their hips and I do their knees. Then this guy, Dave Asprey, became a patient in early 2016. And, you know, Dave Asprey, he, he plans to live to 180. And um, he, he, he came to me and then I started getting his followers. And people would say, you know, can't you just like do my whole body all at once, uh, just sort of preventatively? And I thought about it and I thought, you know, I kind of have been doing that for years with these cowboys. I was doing these massive treatments. And as far as doing it preventatively, it kind of made sense because if I'm treating somebody and they've developed, you know, their arthritis has gotten bad enough over the years that they've started to develop pain. And then that goes on for a period of time. And then we do this treatment and it brings them down past the threshold. And then I get five years of pain relief before they start having pain again. It made sense to me that if you started before they hit the pain threshold, it's still going to turn back the hands of time. So even though someone doesn't have hip pain now, doesn't mean they won't in 10 years. And if we do an intervention now, maybe that'll push it out to 20 years. Now, clearly, I, that's not a scientific statement. I can't say that with certainty, but it made sense to me. So I started doing it. Uh, so this, I'm just going to show you this video of of what this looks like. I call it a full body stem cell makeover. And it's actually the title of this talk. So we, uh, as I said, we do everything under IV sedation. This patient is put to sleep. Uh, he's not unconscious, he's asleep. First, I take a relatively large volume of bone marrow. I, I'm sorry, I take a relatively large volume of fat. Uh, then I take a relatively large volume of bone marrow. We isolate the stem cells from the fat. We concentrate the stem cells from the bone marrow. Uh, we take blood, we activate the, the VSELs from the blood, we prepare all of this. If someone wants to use like growth factors from birth tissues, we do that. Uh, then I do epidural injections. These are stem cell epidurals, not steroid epidurals. So putting stem cells in the epidural space to hopefully address arthritis. Then we do the facet joints at every level from the base of the skull down to the tailbone, both sides, SI joints. Uh, flip the, while I'm doing that, my partner's injecting her uh, the guy's scalp to thicken the hair follicles. We flip the person over. I do the shoulders, the hips, the knees, the ankles, the great toe, the elbows, wrists, thumbs. My partner's doing uh, the skin of the face. 
to improve elasticity and hydration of the skin. Uh, and then she tops it off in men, she injects the penis to improve microcirculation. In women, she does the vagina to improve the elasticity and hydration of the, um, of that, of the vaginal tissue. As far as I know, there is no one in the world doing anything quite like this, uh, probably because no one's crazy enough <laughs> to do it. Uh, if this sounds expensive, it's because it is. Uh, and I, when I had my, heart, my, health, my own health episode uh, in 2016, it occurred to me that getting people out of pain is the greatest gift imaginable. But if someone can't afford it, it doesn't do them any good at all. So since, uh, for the last five years, I have been offering stem cell medicine one day per month uh, at no charge to the medically underserved. And the way we do that is we determine that somebody's living below poverty line. Once we determine that, and there's two pathways. One is if they are, uh, if they are a combat service veteran, I'll treat them for free. If you've served this country in, contact, in combat, I'm happy to do the, the treatment at no charge. The other pathway is, uh, is uh, if someone's not a combat service veteran, we will do it in exchange for community service hours. We've been, as I said, we've been doing that about five years and it's been you know, incredibly rewarding. Um, I have a film, it's free to watch. It's, you can see it on my website or you can go directly to it, stemcellsolutionfilm.com. I just, if you wanna learn more about this stuff, it's free to watch. There's no sales associated with it. You know, feel free to check it out. Um, and then I just wanna close with a little story. So that picture that I put in the beginning of the, of the slideshow of me rock climbing back, you know, when I was 30 years old, I recently started getting a little uh, self-conscious about using that picture because it's such an old picture. So uh, a couple of summer, a couple of springs ago, I went back to that same place in Bishop, California, this time with my daughters and did that same boulder problem. And while we were there, uh, my six-year-old was, uh, was climbing and I had her climbing on an arete and an arete is an outside corner. And what's interesting about climbing on an arete is normally when you're climbing, you just see the wall in front of you. But when you're climbing on an arete, you actually see down how far off the ground you are. It's a lot more scary. So, you know, little BB, she's, you know, make a couple of moves and she'd stop and you'd hear her go, ah. and then she'd make a couple more moves and then I'd hear her go, ah. and then my brother lowered her down and I said, BB, I gave her a big hug and I said, BB, were you scared? And she said, Daddy, I was a little bit scared but I just told myself it's okay to be scared sometime. And this is what I felt like. I have succeeded as a father. I can, I can uh, go to the grave knowing that I've left this world better than how I found it. So uh, please use me as a resource. Uh, please reach out with, uh, with any sort of questions. And thank you so much for your attention. And if you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer any questions now. Yes, great. A great talk, Dr. Addison. Thank you very much. We're all applauding for you. Thank you. We do have a few questions from our groups and know that we are both in YouTube as well as Zooming here. So there's two uh, places where people are watching you right now. Uh, so the first question is, what is the best therapy that you would say, what would you say is the best ther therapy for cervical and the lumbar arthritis, lumbar arthritis? Well, you know, in my opinion, it's this, it's uh, using stem cells from your own body with or without the addition of growth factors from birth tissue, um, you know, for all the reasons I just said, you know, what, what that, that concept of those changes in the microscopic environment, most low back pain and neck pain is from the, is from those changes. And so if we trick the body into thinking that it's been re-injured, launch a healing cascade, uh, then it you know, has the potential to be curative. Thank you. In your opinion, which is better, fat stem cells or stem cells from bone marrow? Uh, I, think they're I think they're equally valuable. If I had to pick one, I would probably pick bone marrow. Uh, but I, I like using both of them. I find that the two work together the best. 
Now there's something called banking stem cells where you can take a stem cell and bank it for future use. Do you have any opinions on banking stem cells? Yeah, so that was part that the, the lawsuit, the FDA versus California Stem Cell Treatment Institute, a big part of that lawsuit was about banking people's own stem cells. And uh, the judge ruled that that is not drug manufacturing and that is the practice of medicine. So that really sort of opens the door to doing it more and more. I haven't done it in the past just because, you know, it, it was much more of a gray area since that ruling just a few months ago. Um, you know, I have mine banked uh, and I think it's worthwhile. I think if you really need a big treatment, you know, God forbid someone, someone came down with Parkinson's or MS or something like that, then you probably would, that's when you would want to go abroad to do culture expanded umbilical cord cells. Interesting. Um, Medicare has been paying for stem cell therapies since November of last year. Do you know, are uh, stem cell therapists like yourself accepting Medicare? Uh, I'm not. Uh, for one, I'm a naturopath, so they don't re even recognize me as a healthcare provider. Uh, so you know, I'm not. I'm not able to. Uh, but you know, I think that slowly, it's. I think it's going to be very slow. I think more and more it will be. I, you know, clearly, it's just going to be simple. You know, and one knee or one shoulder or something like that. Uh, but I think more and more we're going to see that. Um, what is your opinion of someone who's getting epidurals for back pain? Well, epidurals, so I assume they mean steroid epidurals, um, they frequently give short-term relief. Uh, and I'm not philosophically opposed to epi steroid epidural injections. You know, if somebody has a brand new disc herniation, doing a steroid epidural can be curative. The problem is when somebody has chronic pain, then you're not actually doing anything to address the problem. It's just temporarily taking away the pain. Uh, and if you do it enough times, it actually can further degenerate the connective tissue. It can, it can disintegrate the ligaments. So I'm not, you know, I'm not, I, I think doing a steroid epidural here and there, there's times when it's appropriate, but I think as sort of an ongoing uh, strategy for chronic pain, I, it rarely is successful. Okay, thank you. A uh, question just came up. Uh, is there an immune response to Xeno stem cells? Yeah, so th that is something that's commonly reported. So by Xeno stem cells, I think the person means uh, these birth tissue stem cells. Uh, and that is uh, the, the, the only immune response is people can have sort of flu-like symptoms for a couple of days. But what's interesting about these about stem cells is they're, they're what are called immunoprivileged. So your immune system doesn't recognize them uh, as invaders. So it's, there's no such, there does not appear to be any graft versus host disease from using birth tissue stem cells. You can have that little bit of a side effect of the flu-like symptoms, but that's not even quite an immune response. It's, it's, it's another mechanism. Well, great. Great presentation. I'm so glad that you're with us tonight, Dr. Edelson, and I appreciate all that you've given us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it, you guys. I would love to stick. So if you're, if you're finished with me, I'll get back to my family because they're all waiting for me. Naturally. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Next month, we will be in Zoom on, as well as in person at the church, Thursday, December the 15th at the regular time opening for a social hour at 6 p.m. in Zoom and a 6 p.m. social hour over at the church, and then the formal presentation again at 7 p.m. as usual. So I'd like to thank you all for attending our service this month. Be sure to get our monthly email newsletter for updates and on our next service and updates for the great discoveries in age reversal technologies and health practices. Please share this recording of this event with all of the people that you do care about and join us next month for another brilliant presentation here at the Church of Perpetual Life. Thank you.